Howdy. Welcome to another session of sitting with Dr. Lobisi. Uh, as you might have guessed, this isn't Dr. Lobisi. This is his cousin, Donnie Lee. He asked me to stay in for him today, so I figured it'd been a while, so I, I might as well come back and give a, a guest lecture, as it were. Uh, so, so he told me y'all's, uh, in, uh, chapter three, uh, point one, and I'm gonna cover just, uh, a few things, uh, some of the instances that took place within the Catholic Church that seemed to, um, you know, upset, uh, a lot of the Catholics throughout Europe and that contributed to the rise of the Protestant Reformation. All right. So I'm gonna talk about all the, abuses that took place uh within the catholic church and uh before uh what's his name martin luther king no Mar just martin luther right yeah yep just martin luther okay nope not king he's not a king no he's not a king all right that's somebody entirely different that's right okay i'm a little nervous i'm sorry i think i'm gonna take a pause and take a little sip of my coke zero won't you join me? All right. Let's go. Uh, <clears throat> so, some of the things that we've done, talked about already in this class, or y'all talked about with uh, Dr. Lobisi, you mentioned some of the earlier critics of the Catholic Church, and that would include the likes of uh, Marsiglia of Patua, and uh, also... Uh, John, uh, what's his name, Wycliffe, and uh, Jan Hus. Uh, we know that the Catholic Church um, has a way of uh, dealing with people who speak out or challenge or, uh, you know, have, a, have an axe to grind, if you will, with some of their practices. That's right. They declared that they are heretics and uh, threaten them with uh, hellfire and brimstone and uh, excommunication. And then if that don't work, they throw them in the fire. All right. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> what we want to talk about is some of the things that are taking place right here in the beginning of the 15th century. So this is the first time we really be talking about the 15th century, y'all. I mean, we covered a little bit of it in the... Uh, uh, Y'all talked about it with the end of the, um, what's that called? The Renaissance. Um, but this is really the first time we talking about the 15th or 16th century. So this is the beginning of the 1500, 1500s. Uh, so we need to kind of just make sure that we cover everything that some of the abuses that was taking place. All right. And so, um, what, uh, what, what the problem um, that the Catholic Church had kind of centered around this um, issue of salvation, all right? And uh, we, we talked a little bit about the medieval mindset versus the uh, Renaissance mindset and how one was focused on progress and the other one was focused on um, just salvation, all right? And that was something that was heavily on people's minds. And as a result of that, the Catholic Church kind of re responded to that demand by almost making a um like a mechanical way for people to receive their uh salvation so that was more or less guaranteed and that was something that they done liked and so it, it opened the door tremendously to uh what we call abuses all right so this what we need to understand is that people were extremely religious all right and the word that we need to use for that is uh pious or piety pious or piety um and so the people of uh europe were extremely religious devout pious and devoutly pious and as a result um they took their, their they took their religion very seriously and what the priests had to tell them um so we know that there was y'all see this i mean y'all probably like what the heck is this skull what's What's he talking about? Let's just look at this skull because that's what's most important. Because that's really, and it's in a shiny gold box, so this must be important. 
So what in God, what in tarnation is this skull? Well, it's what we call a relic, y'all. And this is what the Catholic Church taught was a way to uh, receive God's grace. All right. So if you went and took took a gander at a at a dead skull, uh, you get to go to heaven. Well, well, no, not entirely, but um, the skull had to be of somebody special. All right, that somebody special had to have been canonized a saint, y'all. And so what that means is days up in heaven, all right? And so a relic was this idea that you could uh, receive um, God's grace. If you visited a holy site where, like a pilgrimage, you took a pilgrimage to where a saint lived, and you uh, made a donation to see the uh, relic, and then God would uh, give unto you uh, his grace, all right? And that means that's his forgiveness and his love. And that is one of the uh, prerequisites for uh, attaining salvation, okay? And so people kind of want crazy with all these relics, all right? And there is this guy here, Frederick the Wise, all right? His name is the elector, or his title is the elector of Saxony. You might be wondering, what the heck is an elector? Well, he, he was one of seven, and we'll talk about this later on when we talk about the election of uh, Emperor uh, Char Charles the V, or no, what Roman numeral five. Uh, I, I lovingly refer to Charles the V, at, uh, or the fifth, Charles the fifth as Chucky V. We're going to talk about Chucky V. And he wasn't, uh, uh, you know, as a leader, he didn't come to the throne like ordinary other Europeans and that his uh, daddy like bequeathed the, uh, you know, his kingdom uh, uh, to his oldest son. That's what we all call, what's that called when you do that? Huh? No, that ain't right. It's called primogeniture. Does everybody remember that? They ain't got that in the Holy Roman Empire. What they got is they got seven large kingdoms within the Holy Roman Empire, and they get to uh, elect who the next uh, leader or the emperor will be, okay? So this guy, Frederick, Freddie the Wise, he's got 19,000 relics, and how in the heck can one person have so many bones or personal possessions of saints? I don't know. That's kind of gross. But what you can be rest assured is that not all 19,000 of them relics was authentic, they were some probably fakes. In Italian, they say that if something's a fake, they call it a fugazi. A fugazi. So they had these phony relics running around. So ain't nobody receiving no uh, God's grace from a from a fake lucky rabbit's foot or whatever the heck it is. Anyway, um, so we're getting into some of this. Uh, some of some of the issues, all right, and this idea that if you die, all right, and you have not yet earned salvation uh, because you died maybe with sin on your soul, um, if it's serious enough sin, you're going to go straight down to the hot place. But if it's what they call uh, venial sins, then, they, then you can't go to heaven, but you ain't going to go to hell. You go to what's called purgatory. Now, purgatory is a place that the Catholic Church kind of invented. All right? They said that, I can't remember when exactly that came about, but sometime during the Middle Ages, they said it it's the place in between. Okay? And so, uh, here's the deal. If, if, if you have a serious sin or this, these sins on your soul, then you've got to go to purgatory and get your soul purified. Uh, and it's not exactly a nice place. It's kind of full of fire, just like hell, maybe. But the only difference is it ain't permanent. Um, so one of the things is you could receive is maybe time off of purgatory uh, if, if you happen to go on a pilgrimage or uh, and, and saw a relic. Does that make sense? All right, then. Good. Um, 
Now, what we need to understand is that because of the uh, laxity of the Catholic Church and their kind of uh, preoccupation with power, especially the upper upper reaches of the Catholic Church. Now, I'm going to throw a fancy word at y'all and just watch. It's going to make your head spin. Are you ready? Okay, here's the word. Uh, High-ranking church officials, you know what that those those positions those positions are called they're called ecclesiastical ecclesiastical what watch your head it's spinning okay now grab it so ecclesiastical positions were preoccupied with power in it most specifically uh the babylonian captivity remember that y'all when the when the uh, uh papacy was moved from rome to avignon france and then they had the uh, Great Schism, where there was two and then even three popes. All of that kind of led people to um, kind of decide for themselves exp that the church ain't really being a very good leader and ain't good in being a good spiritual leader, and so they're going to find other ways to, to get that kind of spiritual nourishment, y'all, okay? And so they turned to other things, and there was this here fellow named Thomas Akempis, and he wrote a very popular book called The Imitation of Christ, and that's exactly what he called on people to do. And this guy was just an ordinary feller. He was no clergy member. What you call an ordinary feller ain't no clergy member. That's right. Who said that? Was that you, Nathan? Very good, Mr. Shaver. You're just a little old freshman, but you ain't too... you kind of smart. All right, I'm proud of you, son. Okay, so... Uh, they uh they called lay people all right and these lay people um started to come up with their own ideas because the catholic church ain't really leading so they meant you know they they were saying that we all need to uh um imitate the way of, of christ okay and live a very simple life and one that's not focused on any of that those crazy relics and pilgrimages or other rituals that could be classified y'all as superstitious okay so look at this right here this is uh this is oh what's that called when it's a uh, mary with the baby jesus what's that called no no it's it is well isn't that that old lady that sings like a virgin no oh it is madonna okay it's just not her it's called a madonna okay that's it thank you but you see this is heaven all right and here all this this is a pope and some some other important people and this angel is going down there and he's grabbing this guy from purgatory and bringing him back up to heaven all right so that's all that fire down there that's in purgatory okay so that was kind of related to what we talked about rise of pietism all right so people were very serious about their their faith okay and here is a map of the great schism and it shows how the people of europe were divided as far as which pope they was uh, gonna follow obviously the purple were uh, kind of loyal to the Pope in Rome and then the green because this is Avignon, France. They were loyal to the Pope there, okay? And then here in the yellow, it's uh, kind of the Holy Roman Empire. They, they's kind of stuck in the middle. They don't, don't rightly know who they want to support, okay? And this is the this is where that guy, that fellow Martin Luther is going to be from, okay? He's going to be from up here, all right? Up in this, the, up in this region, kind of northeastern section. Um okay so the catholic church was preoccupied with its own wealth and its own power and this was not uh this did not go unnoticed and remember uh because of the renaissance and there was this rebirth of education and whatnot people started to uh pick up on that stuff a little bit easier right and the invention in 1440 1450 of the uh uh the invention of the printing press people with the you know advent of new books getting invented and stuff like that and more and more people starting to read the the, the skepticism that the people have for the catholic church began to rise it began to rise all right okay i'm getting excited uh here so i got a couple neat little uh uh visuals i like visuals okay so look at here just so you know, okay, in case, in case you was ever confused, that remember, what's this? Pope, Cardinal, Archbishop, Bishop. What do we call these people? That's right. I said it earlier. Well, you should know. Can't you remember? Ecclesiastical. So these are the ecclesiastical uh, positions within the church, and this is the lower level, 
and then the laity, right? That's you, the common people. All right, and here's some more. All right, over on this side, these are the people who run um, the monasteries and stuff, and that's where the where the um, where the friars or the monks or the nuns live. Okay, so anyway, um, just making sure you all know that. I thought that that would be important to throw that in there. Okay, so we're going to talk about three things. Okay, and these three things are the most important thing you're ever going to learn in your entire life. All right, you ready? Okay, um, these three things are the abuses of the Catholic Church. And they are, one, clerical immorality. Two, clerical ignorance. And where's three? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's on the next slide. I think it's uh, clerical, I uh, don't oh, know. What is it? What's the third one? Clerical ignorance. Immorality, clerical ignorance, and then the last one, well, I look like a big old dummy because I don't know. All right. Anyway, we're going to move on. Uh, <clears throat> oh, pluralism. There it is right there. Okay, so clerical immorality, clerical ignorance, and clerical pluralism. All right. So that has to do with the practice of holding more than one church position at a time. And there's another one that's associated with that called uh, absenteeism because if you've got more than one church position, like an ecclesiastical position, how are you going to be on two places at once? And so a lot of these were given to people who were not religious billers. And they were being rewarded by the king or something. Um, and they got these positions because they got access to all the tithing. All right. The Catholic Church is the richest institution in the world. Still is to this day. Okay. So he got even more money than Walmart or Amazon. That's crazy. Okay, and then there was something called simony, and that's the selling of church office, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so kings would either sell it or, or, or appoint people that was loyal to them. And so you got all kinds of people running the church that ain't even religious, and and that they're not qualified to do the job, and and there there you go. Okay, and so what the problem is when you ain't got no leadership at the top, sooner or later down below you start to see the problems, okay? And one of them was clerical immorality. So if you got somebody that's to be a bishop, now the bishop is in charge of an entire diocese, and his responsibility is to is to oversee his flock, okay? And he's supposed to vi visit each parish church, and he's got, he's got to make sure that the priest is doing what he's supposed to. He's got to make sure that the priest is well-educated, and he's supposed to oversee and maintain a seminary. All right, and that's when they go, that's when the young fellers go, they want to be priests or something, and they go to the the the, the Bible learning place. It's a school, y'all, and they learn how to um, read the Bible and understand scriptures, and uh, it, it they learn how to be holy and whatnot. All right, and so you got all these fellers that ain't doing their job, and then we start to get problems with, uh, nobody's looking, nobody's minding the store, all right, and you know what they say, when the, when the cat is away, the mice will play, all right, and so we got priests breaking their vows and doing all kinds of, not just priests, but monks and brothers and friars and all, all of them just being scandalous and all of that, okay, so here it is right here, that was a big one, okay, and this is something that didn't, you know, really, wasn't very appetizing to the people. They they kind of were disgusted when they saw these kinds of things like that. Okay, and then charges of clerical ignorance was a problem because, like I said, they weren't maintaining the uh, uh, the seminaries where, where they learn to be priests, and so th they're churning out priests that aren't very qualified because they gotta understand the Bible's written in Latin, and many of them don't know how to read Latin because they's a big dummy and they is ignorant. All right, and so that's a problem. Okay. And then uh, we, we, we start to see evidence of in literature that people don't like this, okay? In books like we've already talked about, the Decameron by, by Boccaccio and Canterbury Tale, they make fun of um, the, uh, the, cl the clergy, Ma mainly like the friars, okay? These are the people who administer to the common, the more common folks, the laity. And so they were the ones most oftentimes made fun of, okay? And, and it's because they were immoral, all right? Uh, <clears throat> we've talked about this before, mendicant orders, or y'all talked about with uh, my cousin, Dr. 
Lobezi talked about Dominican order friars and they, the people who were beggars and then they was using the money that they begged to, you know, buy wine, women, and song. All right, so that's not good. Uh, <clears throat> here's the problem with the absenteeism. Okay, we kind of already mentioned this earlier. People were occupying multiple offices, using it to pay themselves, to enrich themselves, and, and they weren't uh, doing a good job of uh, overseeing, you know, the church or their diocese or whatever it was that they were responsible for. So they would sell cardinal positions and uh, bishop positions. And, and the thing about it is, if, if you got a feller that's not qualified and he all of a sudden is a point, he buys a position where he's a cardinal, who do you think, where do you think the popes are selected from? Them popes are selected from a, from the College of Cardinals. And so it's likely that some of the popes, and this is true, some of the popes, they weren't even men of religion, all right? They, they came to the papacy and they're just secular, ordinary lay people. Um, and that's not good. And that's why we have all, during this time period, a lot of problems with the popes because the popes are not very religious men because they didn't start out that way. Does y'all make sense? Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay. So I think that that's about all we need to know on this slide. Let's move on. Um, so one of the other reasons why people were upset with the, uh, with the clergy, okay, and there we, we see the rise of what's called anti-clericalism, and that's just people, you know, angry and suspicious, and they just don't have a very high opinion uh, of, uh, of a lot of the clergy. It's due to the fact that, that they had a lot of privileges, okay? And if, they, if, if you had a, a, you know, a seminary or whatever in a, in a town or something like that, or whatever clergy members lived within a town, they, they did not have to pay taxes, and they were exempt from having to serve in the military and other things like that. And people were just a little bit jealous, thought that that was unfair that these men who were kind of corrupt oftentimes or immoral were also getting a double, you know, privilege of not having to pay taxes or not, not having to serve in the military. And so those are some of the things that kind of started to upset people, okay? And so... By the time Martin Luther comes around in 1517, okay, that's 500 years ago, 1517, uh, it, it had reached a critical mass, all right? And so if it wasn't Martin Luther, it was probably going to be somebody else that popped in there and said, you know, enough is enough, okay? Um, so we need to go back to uh, some of the ways the, the, the church talked about salvation, Okay. So we already said taking part in seeing them um, relics was a way to receive God's grace. There's seven other, there's seven ways, okay, and they're called sacraments. And they are baptism, uh, reconciliation, that's when you go see the priest and you tell your sins, and then you get Eucharist. And that's the most important one, and we'll talk about the Eucharist in a little bit, okay? Uh, penance is reconciliation. Penance is the same thing as reconciliation. And then marriage is one. Holy orders is one. And then they got one called anointing of the sick. Okay. And uh, I think that's seven. I don't know, six or seven. That's it. But anyway, if you received a, a sacrament that was an antidote to sin. Okay. And the most important one was the Eucharist. So every time you go to church, you received Eucharist. All right. And that's the 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 body of Christ, okay, they give you a communion wafer of unleavened bread, unleavened, that means it ain't got no what, it's not flour, no, what's the stuff that makes it rise, what makes bread rise, it didn't have any of this, what's it called, it begins with a why, yep, yeast, ain't got no yeast, unleavened bread don't have yeast, and so that's what a communion wafer is, it's kind of like a cracker, Okay, and so anyway, when you receive these, you receive God's grace, okay, and like I said, the most important one is the Eucharist, and that is what the whole religion, when you go to church on Sunday in a Catholic church, it's called a Mass, and the Mass is all about receiving the Eucharist, okay? If you go to another church, like a Protestant church, you listen to the preacher, and he starts uh, talking about the Bible, and then he starts you know, moving around and getting people all excited and he gives a very like uplifting and, and, and emotional uh, sermon or a homily. Well, 
That ain't the Catholic Church, that's for doggone sure. Most of the priests are about as boring as they can get. Because, and I don't mean no disrespect, there's a couple good ones out there, but um, the, that ain't the point. That ain't For Catholics, that ain't the point. It's not about the message. I mean, that's important, and they try to make it, you know, the priests try to, to, to make it give you a relevant message so that you can get your spiritual nourishment. But for Catholics, that's not how they get their spiritual nourishment. They get it through the Eucharist. Okay, and that's one of the big differences between Catholic churches and Protestant churches is that usually the Protestant churches have probably got a minister or pro a preacher up there. It's probably fairly interesting. But in the Catholic church, it's not as emphasized. All right, anyway. Uh, so remember, we talk about the critics of the Catholic church, and a lot of them were lay people. And they start to rediscover, because they know how to read, uh, some of the teachings of the early church fathers like Paul of Tarsus <coughs> and Augustine of Hippo and how they had talked about um, God's grace and that salvation wasn't something that you, you could earn. The Catholic Church was teaching that you can earn salvation, okay, if you did good deeds or good works and if you avoided sin. And if you got your sins forgiven and you went to church every week and then you took Eucharist and every time you received a sacrament, you were receiving God's grace. And as long as you, when you went to confession and you said your sins and the priest would give you what's called the, your penance, as long as you worked off your penance, then the stain was wiped away and you go into heaven. All right. Well, that's not really what the early church fathers said, that the early church fathers said, that you got to have faith in the fact that God loved us all so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for our sins. And that is the, the, the essence of what you have to believe. you got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, and that's what gets you the salvation. All right? It's not all of these sacraments. Okay? And so that's like a bit, and we're going to go into that further anyway. Um yeah, talking about um, those these lay people, these lay organizations. They remember there were the Lollards, the Hussites, and then the um, the Brethren of the Common Life. They're all over the place. Okay, they got the Lollards in England. You got the Hussites over here in uh, in uh, like the Czech Republic near Prague, right here, and then all throughout the Holy Roman Empire, you got the Brethren of the Common Life. Okay, and so they're starting to get more and more popular. All right, and uh, so there you have it, all right? <clears throat> now, the Catholic Church had sold something called indulgences, which were forgivenesses, and that's what we're going to get into in the next section, okay? We're going to, we're going to get into the, uh, the, the real abuses with the, within the Catholic Church, like, if, like there ain't enough already, but there's one called indulgences, and so in the next installment, we're going to learn about that. But here, um, one of the things that, like, uh, one of the sacraments was confession all right um or penance you go in and you tell this you tell your priest now the priest because he's ordained he's supposed to possess some miraculous power okay i lovingly refer to this miraculous power as the mojo all right so the priest has got the mojo and if you go to confession and you are contrite that means you're sorrowful if you go to confession with a contrite heart and you confess the sins that you have uh, uh, committed, the priest has the mojo to forgive your sins, to wipe, wash them away, all right? But the stain of the sin still remains, and then he gives you a penance. And the penance may be a bunch of good works that you're supposed to do or a bunch of prayers that you're supposed to pray, or you can even make some, you know, take make some donations to the church or something, or give to the poor, make, give alms to the poor. That's how you earn or get that stain of the sin wiped away. And that's why you don't have to go to penance. I mean, purgatory, sorry. Okay, so um, we're going to be getting into the mojo and then in the indulgences and then something called transubstantiation, which I get excited about. Anyway, that's it for now. Thank you.